Within the depths of the police station of the damned lies a dank holding cell filled with the dregs of humanity. Past the creaking cots, empty save for drunks sleeping one off. Beyond the rusting door guarding the sepulchre, housing the city's perverts and heretics, a secret society assembles to scrutinize a film rumored to drive its viewers to madness and dissolution. Draw closer, dear listener. Let your trembling ears sup upon the eldritch knowledge of the Cinemania Society. We the 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 story so far. A society in a desperate and misguided sense to save a strip mall of the damned from condemnation and redevelopment tried to pull an Arthur Dent by laying down in the mud in front of a few bulldozers and thereby block the path of progress. A city attorney tries to reason with them, seeing as the society failed for months to respond in any way to the city's requests for comments about their plans, but after some predictably infantile resistance on the part of the society, she eventually calls the police. While everyone awaits the arrival of the fuzz, the society, cocktails in hand and as it's firmly in the mud, resumes its analysis of Ralph Bakshi's Wizards, an animated post-apocalyptic fantasy with nipples and Nazis in amounts of which shame heavy Metal. Ten million years after the nuclear apocalypse, twin wizards Avatar and Black Wolf duke it out for supremacy in an irradiated ruins of Earth. The good guys aren't really all that great, but at least they aren't a pack of fascists who and Black Wolf are supercharged with the Dream Machine, an ancient half-magical film projector that uses old Nazi propaganda movies to stun the minds of the anti-fascists into helplessness. Avatar the Good Wizard, along with his underdressed half-fairy apprentice Princess Eleanor, the incompetent elven warrior Weehawk, and Peace, a reprogrammed robot mutant or mutant robot assassin, all go on a quest for a variety of easily animated backgrounds to end Black Wolf's Holocaust. To Black Wolf's Fortress in the irradiated land of Scorch, spelt with a T because fuck you, the stage is set for the final battle. Speaking of final battles, the society are placed under arrest, bundled into a paddy wagon, and driven off to be booked into holding, where they are about to conclude what may be their final conclave. We have a job to do, people, as this conclave's pontifex of presentment. It is my duty to remind everyone we have a job to do. I am aware that while the conditions are... Less than opti- Yes, Andre. <laughs> I gotta pee. Just go. The toilet's right there. But I don't want to do it in front of everyone. Pfft, there's no modesty in jail. Well, actually, this isn't jail. It's just holding. Well, actually, dude, you're sitting on a toilet behind bars. Is that close enough to jail for you? Speaking of modesty, XYZ. What? XYZ, your fly's your, down. Your fly's down. Oh, excuse me. The cops got a little overzealous while doing the strip search. Good thing I didn't go commando today. <laughs> wait, wait. Am I the only one who got strip searched? What the hell? Hey, I asked them to do a cavity search, but they turned me down. There's an image. Woof. Ah, uh, somebody get me the mind bleach. I could go for a hit of mind bleach right now. Now there's a surprise. Someone should stay at an intervention. Anybody who tries that better pack a lunch. And I really gotta go. Ethan, can you- Address me by my title. Uh, Inquisitor Ethan, Keeper of the Lenses. Can you please move? As per society bylaws, whomsoever is serving as Pontifex of Presentment requires a probe. This is the closest thing we have in this room. Therefore, I am disinclined to acquiesce to your request. God damn it! Now, shall we resume? Who is narrating part three of Wizards? Andre? I'll do it. I'll take this one. <clears throat> so, we rejoin our party in the encampment of the Army of Good, although, to be honest, they just look a little bit raggedy. A few of them have purloined automatic weapons, but most of it is just your standard barbarian types. Imagine an army of old school DD archetypes all jumbled together, and you get the idea. Lots of furry loincloths and horny helmets. Uh, I mean, pointy protectors. Uh, I mean to say, ah, that the horn-helmed warriors are all quivering and tumescent. <coughs> <laughs> That's a hard point to make. <laughs> I feel dirty. The leader of these guys is never really named, except for a mumbled acknowledgement from Avatar at one point, but why bother with characterization right now? He's big, his helmet is super polished and horny as hell, and he's got a plan. All he needs is a wizard, and he's got a seriously gnarly posse behind him. But Avatar is having none of it, and is furious, punching his buddy to the ground. Kinda comes out of nowhere as well, he just smacks him. 
Yeah, no, that was uh, that was kind of an odd thing. You've got this this big beardy elf with a horny helmet, and then suddenly Avatar uh, beats him down. Like it's a choice. It's a choice. Yeah, and this is the point this where you expect. Entire movie was a choice. This is a point where you'd expect Avatar to go on a long rant about how he never wanted to see armies on the march. You can't solve violence with violence. Yada yada, but he just sort of stands there looking a bit confused. Horny Brian Blessed has got plenty of rant to go around, though. In days of yore, and you remember yore, it was before yesteryear, Avatar was a messiah, curing radiation sickness from men and birds. Specifically, only men and birds are mentioned. And now here he is, along with him. A woman child, one elf, and a moron robot. This should be presented as Avatar having a Yoda-like philosophical discussion about why you can't solve your problems by fighting, but instead, when asked to join up, he just hits someone, leaves, and refuses to elaborate. A real missed opportunity to explain what the hell the old man is all about. Yeah, th this was a real missed opportunity. I mean, you could have had some kind of pontification, you know, about fascism, like, like you said, it, uh, really... They could have made some stuff. Other, another side point here, too, is that he specifically refers to Eleanor as a woman child, which yeah. uh, when we were sort of talking about the potential... Uh, I mean, oh, is he sort of talking in elf terms, like how everyone's a child because I'm a thousand years old, or is he just saying, yeah, she's a woman child? We don't know. It's just the... commenting on how she's simultaneously sexualized and infantilized. Yeah, She like... totally is, yeah. Not just that, but like, you know, it kind of adds some, some additional, like, gross shading to, you know, she is being trained by Avatar. Like, it just really makes it seem icky. Trained or groomed? Yeah. A lot of training then. While the encampment is sleeping, Peace, the moron robot, is sitting on a cliff, and Eleanor wanders over, perhaps to discuss the duality of the situation, seeing as her nipples are so pointy, she looks like she's trying to indicate both sides of the argument at once. However, Avatar and Weehawk are awoken by her girly screams. A black, sort of poorly animated blobby cloud thing is suddenly there. Avatar surmises that Black Wolf is trying to retake control over peace. Back to hell, Avatar cries, and since the budget won't stretch to a confrontation, the blob obliges and buggers off. It turns out that the uh, comforting presence of Eleanor has caused Peace's mental fortitude to slip for a moment, letting Black Wolf in. Frankly, the way Eleanor is dressed, it's amazing anyone can even walk straight. She's like a walking advertisement for custard and trampolines. <laughs> you can't take her seriously in any way. <laughs> the way she's just boinging around. And her voice, just that baby voice, oh. The weird thing is too, is that if you go look up the actress here, if you actually go to look at her IMDB profile, she actually looks significantly like the character that they drew for her. Um, it's kind of odd. Well, I just hope she doesn't genuinely sound like her. Wouldn't wish that on anyone. Yeah, um, I mean, I just thought it was kind of odd because they, like, I thought that was a more recent thing with Disney making the characters that they animate look like the actors who portray them. Well, in this case, uh, oh, they actually did that. No, I think that's something that's been happening for a long time. I know but, Disney had done it for a while, at least since the 60s. Really? Uh, yeah. yeah, when they were doing Alice Either in Wonderland, they, would... they, um, they actually looked like they got actors in that they thought would look good and drew off their performances in order yeah. to create the... Good point. They did rotoscope. That's what they did rotoscoping with. I just thought that... Yeah, anyway. Sorry. Uh, just misperception. It definitely is modern times now. They definitely do do it more, like with motion capture and everything to make the mouths mm. move the same. But they had the idea back before they had the technology. Yeah. Well, if we hadn't had Boingy or Eleanor, we wouldn't now have Thanos. So, <laughs> Suddenly, there is the sound of shooting from off screen. An actual, no kidding, tank has rolled up to the guys and Peace is fighting it. There shall be no explanation for this, so crave not what she shall never receive. It's actually a surprisingly well done scene because the tank has been rotoscoped out of some old WW2 footage from the looks of things and conveys suitable menace. Peace leaps atop the twisting turret to totally tender a torrent of torment on the tank top when Eleanor, for no reason, steals Weehawk's sword and hurls it, spearing him right through the jumpsuit. Peace deflates as Eleanor hops aboard the machine and rolls off into the fog. But why? Yeah, this it does is... come out of nowhere. Yeah, out of complete nowhere. It's just like, wait, what, huh? Does she, does she straddle the gun turret when she jumps on there? I that might have been a bit remember. difficult to animate, but I'm pretty sure there's something like that in there. Seems like something they would do for her character. Yeah. Scene's running on too long. Throw in a tank. 
Well, anyway, soon the final battle is going to begin. Everyone has loaded aboard a fleet of fantastical grimdark ships to head for Black Wolf's place and politely ask him to stop with all the fascism. Avatar is just off in a corner muttering to himself, and Weehawk believes that Eleanor's apparent betrayal has broken the old man's heart. The leader guy insists, in the face of all evidence, that Avatar is just fine and the attack will begin as planned. Which just goes to show why you should never take advice on mental health from a guy with a helmet but no trousers. Well, this is also the same guy whom Avatar beat down in the preceding couple of scenes, right? Yeah, he's used to just saying everything's fine, we, we go on. And I think it's one of the few scenes where Avatar's not smoking a cigar, so you definitely know something's wrong with him. Well, you know, you could look at this again as a little bit more allegory about, you know, if the left could get its shit together and stop fighting amongst itself, it could actually present a unified front against fascists. The grimdark Malarian ships enter some grimdark Malarian scenery and everything becomes twisted and fantastical, which is how you know they're approaching Scorch One, the lair of Black Wolf. It's clear that this is a bit where they put the most effort in. The One is how you know it's sci-fi. <laughs> yeah, no joke, these backgrounds are sick. Weehawk's plan is to walk right in, because no one would expect that. You know, this is why no one puts elves in charge of Combined Arms' logistical efforts. By now, Avatar is really starting to lose it, and just starts randomly conjuring flowers and whatnot in his adult state. I'm trying to figure out, like, why is it that he, he goes completely sideways like this when Eleanor ditches them? Again, they've, they've not really developed the character enough, so his left turn here, we don't really have a handle on what's going on with him. Within Scorch, prisoners are being tormented by various types of generally bad dudes, most of whom are now openly wearing swastikas. Hitler's speeches are playing over the PA system, and he actually got a mention in the credits, so if you're ever playing Five Degrees of Kevin Bacon, you can now link Mark Hamill with De Fura. In one degree. <laughs> yeah. Amazingly, it is sadly true. Fantasy Nazis are having a grand old time, chilling out with prostitutes and making fairies sing for them in beer halls. It's like that scene in Casablanca, except having made that comparison, I now need to scoop out my brain with a melon baller and go lie down. <laughs> I hate even comparing <laughs> those two scenes. <laughs> having observed the goings on, Avatar snaps. He advances on a skull-faced guy in an SS uniform who has a prostafairy with him and starts ranting about how war isn't the answer, everything could be beautiful, and he starts throwing flowers around. One wonders how far he expected to get with this argument against a guy with a literal skull for a head. But in fact, the general finds it all hilarious. So you were talking about how if the left could all get together, you know, and stop infighting. I wonder if... Um... Avatar here is supposed to represent like the the hippies, the super, um, the peaceniks, the what do you call them? There's, there's definitely something sort of anti-Vietnam War about his attitude at this point. The futility of the people who want nothing but peace mm. and nothing but flowers, and you know. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely capital S saying something. Mm. Yeah, what that something is is unclear, but maybe maybe it's this. Well, the guy he's saying it to is actually quite a charming Nazi when you get to know him. Even when Larry the Mutant Lizard person shows up and inexplicably recognizes the flower power Hippy Dip is really the great and powerful avatar, the general just laughs heartily and doesn't believe him. Lovely guy for a Nazi, it would seem. But good humor and good manners don't always make for a good person. Anyway, Weehawk fucking stabs him in the gizzards and starts a big fight, because Weehawk actually understands that direct action is the only effective way to deal with a fucking Nazi. Critical support from Comrade Weehawk. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Bakshi's anti-fascist action for the win. That's one of the clearest statements made in this film, I think. Um, also, side note, if you want to hear more about the history of anti-fascist cinema, Margaret Kiljoy's podcast, Cool People Who Did Cool Stuff, did a couple of really excellent episodes on anti-fascist cinema in the early 20th century. Um, she goes into some detail about badasses like Max Schreck. Have you guys ever heard of Max Schreck? Oh, yeah, the, the Count. Yeah, yeah, this is the guy who played Count Orlock in the first film adaptation of Dracula. It was actually an unlicensed one. They called it Nosferatu. Max Schreck was an anti-fascist street fighter in Weimar, Germany, and, and a bouncer at a queer nightclub in Weimar, Germany, and uh, definitely had no problem throwing hands and punching Nazis. Uh, literal Nazis in this case, punching literal Nazis. Um, also mentions Bela Lugosi, um, who also played Dracula. He's, when people think of Dracula, he's who you think of. He's the guy who played Dracula in the first 
uh, licensed adaptation of Dracula. Um, he fought fascists in Hungary and in the United States, helped found the Screen Actors Guild in the 30s, um, and then was one of the most prominent people in the United States uh, from Hollywood who was demanding that Washington rescue Jews from Nazi persecution, in his case, specifically Hungarian Jews. Um, they also mentioned filmmaker Fritz Lang, who was a committed anti-fascist, um, who took on the subject in his film Metropolis, which you guys might have heard of. Um, it's the first ever film to depict a futuristic urban dystopia um, and inspired basically just about every one of the greatest films of the second half of the 20th century. Um, C-3PO was designed after the, the robot woman. And um, so was Robocop. Yeah, that's right. Robocop as well. Um, like there's a number of movies who that were inspired by uh, that were inspired by Metropolis, including Frankenstein, Blade Runner, Star Wars, Dark City, Doctor Strangelove. Like you can just about every other film that followed it in one way or another. If it's a sci fi film, it owes some of its cinematic genetic legacy to uh, Metropolis. Um, also, uh, Tim Burton fans have probably heard of the film The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, um, which is usually held up as the example of German expressionist cinema. Um, and there's usually not a whole lot of other discussion about German expressionism, which was explicitly anti-fascist and heavily tied into with uh, anti-fascist playwright Bertolt Brecht. And the whole movement was a pushback against rising fascist sentiment in Weimar Germany. Um, so it's funny, people talk about German expressionism and they point to a couple of films, but they don't really discuss the movement and what was behind it for reasons. Um, I'm not going to get into all of it here. I mean, because like, really, this is, we have our own thing to talk about and Margaret Kiljoy, frankly, does a better job. So go and listen to those episodes of cool people who did cool stuff and talk about it on our subreddit at r slash the Cinemania Society. Well, they say the devil has the best tunes, but it looks like the good guys have all the great movies. Fuck yeah, dude. Yeah. Well, when Wee Hawk's fight is over, Avatar comes to his senses and seems to realize that things are truly out of hand. Off they go to the castle. As dawn breaks, the invading good guys march ashore, spears glinting and determination in their eyes. The bad guys wait, machine guns ready, and start having a right good laugh about what a one-sided battle this is going to be. And what a battle it is. Horses by the thousands, soldiers, knights, tanks, guns, an incredible array of armored fury, mainly because they nicked all the footage from war films, added a few color filters, and rotoscoped it all. It might be outright theft, but it sure, does make, uh, <laughs> it sure does make for a hell of a battle sequence. None of it makes much sense, of course, but there's a lot of it. And a lot of it reused from earlier battle scenes, including the Zulus, the Crusader Knights. and Oh, yeah. yeah. And this is a long battle. Uh, there's, there's a hell of a lot of it going on. Uh, halfway through it all, the prog rock funk bass and wacka wacka guitar starts up, and you can tell that they put a lot of long nights into it. Long cocaine-fueled nights with lots of Pink Floyd on the hi-fi. Allegedly. 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 The point we're trying to make here is that this is the kind of thing you see when you eat the whole brownie in one go. I believe you brothers can speak to the truth of that now, am I right? Wasn't that a pretty common thing to do back then, to reuse animation? Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, Just because it was so difficult to animate. I mean, I was watching some old Disney films with my kids the other day, and there's definite scenes that are reused over and over. Yeah, Robin they Hood basically a tiny reused a, a ton of Jungle Book. They, like, they literally took exactly. the cells, recolored them, yeah. It was a common thing, so, you know. And uh, we were watching um, The Sword in the Stone, and there's a clear scene from Bambi. <laughs> Recycling. <laughs> yeah, and the scene where the kid falls down the stairs gets used twice. That Shit's wasn't necessarily expensive. It. you got to use what you got. Yeah. Yeah, we can't shit too hard on 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 uh, Ralph Bakshi for reusing stuff. Um, like uh, it's yeah. the sa same thing. Like you know, Andy and I were doing an animation, and you know, I re we recycled some stuff in it. So yeah. you know, it's hard. It's labor intensive. So save uh, labor saving steps are part of the game. Hmm. Well, unfortunately, the battle isn't going particularly well for anyone. It's psychedelic chaos. Watching from the castle, Avatar and Weehawk wonder what to do about it. Black Wolf's girlfriend is here, yeah, remember her? With babe in arms, and she's generally upset about this too, ranting on about how it's not so cool that everybody's dying. One thing's clear, Eva Braun, she ain't. This lady has a conscience. 
Our heroes discover Eleanor just sort of sitting in a corner, and it turns out that the black blobby cloud thing that tried to take peace got in her head, and it was all mind control from there. So that mystery is all wrapped up nicely. Yeah. It is now time for the final confrontation between Black Wolf and Avatar. The brothers meet in front of a lovingly rendered backdrop of melting cubist nightmare chaos architecture. This is Black damn Wolf good. This is this is some of Ian Miller's best work, most iconic. Um, and and you can see it come back again in Realms of Chaos. Like he he definitely was like, oh, this is cool. Let me draw more like this. So you'll see this in a lot of the work that he did for. Oh yeah, he's going shop. buck wild here. This is great. Yeah. Black Wolf does the whole surrender all is lost. No need to throw your life away. Slash, we're not so different, you and I. Join me and together we can rule. Spiel. In return, Avatar chuckles and replies that Mon taught him a special magic trick for occasions like this. Avatar the Great rolls up his sleeves and pulls out a Luger. He straight up shoots Black Wolf straight through the heart like a stone-cold gangster. Hey, it's a kind of magic. <laughs> so, and here's a quick note for anyone who says, Hey, he used technology. Avatar just broke his own rules. This is just your reminder that fascists don't play by the rules, especially not the rules they make themselves. But they expect you to play by the rules. Uh, so if you're going to stop someone from doing a fascism, sometimes you got to break the rules. Black Wolf's dying gasp could only have been better if it had been so much for the tolerant laugh. <laughs> yeah. Another another stab at how pacifism won't work. <laughs> well, I sadly, say... uh, for all of its good points, sometimes pacifism isn't enough. No. Yeah, the rules only work if everybody plays by them, and when somebody stops playing by the rules and basically adopts a win at all costs tactic, then you kind of have to use their own tools to fight them. Um, yeah, when, when one side has got actual skull faces, you're in trouble. Yeah. Are we the baddies? <laughs> Well, everything starts disintegrating because that's the rule with magical fortresses of evil. You kill the big bad, everything goes into self-destruct mode. The dream machine explodes. Shame they didn't use stock footage of a frame burn. Real lost opportunity there. And Avatar, Eleanor, and Weehawk escape. No word on Black Wolf's blue-skinned girlfriend and her newborn, though. But who cares about them? The world is free. The forces that Black Wolf summoned up simply disperse, all to tinkly music and another bored-sounding voiceover. Once again, we're in easy-to-animate slideshow vision. All is well, the land is at peace, Hitler's dead again, and the elves are working hard to mop up the survivors. Not kidding, the bored lady specifies both of those things. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to deal with any kind of uh, asymmetric warfare slash insurgency thing happening for decades afterward. There's no discussion about that. Uh, but... I mean, I'm on the side of peace and good, but when it comes to elven death squads, I'm a little more uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Is the point here that if we just shot Hitler, everything would have just been over? Simple and nice and easy? Uh, not so great at the nation building, just the invasion part. Who could have seen it coming? Well, you know, I do have to say, we, you know, that that was one instance in which nation building actually did good. Um, the the Marshall Plan, you know, they they recognized that. Oh, wait a minute, maybe like you know, sitting on on the head of a nation and a whole group of people and just basically like like squeezing them for all their their financially worth, like happened at the end of the First World War. Maybe that doesn't turn out so good. If we don't want a third one of these, maybe we need to rebuild what we destroyed and and actually try to help retrain people. I up. think that's uh, that's probably a little bit more of a deep reading into the post-war scenario than Bakshi is really able to give us at this juncture because yeah. all that's left is a little bit of slapstick to sign us off. We all have a little more of Larry the Mutant Lizard person being servile to his new overlords. Avatar overcomes his anti-mutant bigotry to let Larry go because it's not his fault. Huzzah! Weehawk is going to go back home and be king. Huzzah! Eleanor is back to being good, huzzah. Avatar is feeling rejuvenated, huzzah. He and Eleanor got married, off screen naturally, and they go off for a mighty shag fest. Uh, what? Isn't he like three times her age? Or At more. least. Yeah. Credits roll. Credits that include actual Hitler. And then they have the sheer brass balls to add in the boilerplate about how any resemblance to actual persons is purely coincidental. It's fucking Hitler. <laughs> why, why do they think he needs a credit or deserves one? What, do they think they're going to get sued? They're basically suggesting that legally he isn't a real person living or dead. 
<laughs> but yet they credit him. They don't, they don't want the Hitler estate coming after them. Pure um. coincidence. <laughs> well, I suppose that about wraps it up for Ralph Bakshi's wizards. Oh, thank God, I feel like I'm about to pop a kidney. Uh, excuse me, but have we adjourned yet? We still have judgment to render. I'm g- guilty! <laughs> it's not that simple. He must first deliberate. So we know why we have rendered our guilty verdict. Oh, you sadistic bastards. No time for flattery. We have a job to do. Hey, you nerds got sprung. You get to go home. date here. Oh, geez, not what? what? Uh, fucking guy. Uh, oh, what? God. Damn it. You're not happy to see me? Uh, this is the closest I have ever come to being happy to see you, but not quite. Hope springs eternal, huh? Not even when I've got you all out of jail. Such ingratitude. What is that thing on your head? It's like a dead possum. Classic. It's a wig. You know, you don't have to wear those here. Your lawyer. I'm a barrister, I love you know. Has accepted this restraining order on your behalf. The city won't press charges so long as you stay away from the TBD shopping plaza redevelopment site. For the last time, it's the strip mall of the damned. I honestly don't care what you call it, so long as you stay away from those condemned buildings. For God's sake. They're full of black mold and asbestos. Why do you even... Wait, where's the kid? I'm here. Sorry. Sorry. I had to take care of some... Uh, whoops. What'd I miss? I'll catch you up later. Anyway, you're free to go. Bus stop is half a block down. Are we not even going to discuss Brother Methuselah somehow being a lawyer? Barrister! Bollockster. <gasps> I believe when Brother Methuselah first started practicing, the Roman Empire called it a Juris Consulti. And take that wig off. We're in the bloody bus stop, not a courtroom. I didn't even know he had a suit. I've only seen him in that moldy old bathrobe and fez. Well, we still haven't adjourned. We may as well render our judgment while we await the bus. Let us now hear deliberation from each of you. You mean judgment? Yes. Let's hear your deliberation and judgment, Zach. All right. <clears throat> First time I saw this movie, I was in the fifth grade. I was having a slumber party, my first slumber party, and we rented a video player, a top loader, because we didn't have our own VCR, and my parents rented some movies. So on top of the never-ending story, they got Wizards. I'd never seen Wizards, neither had any of us. We watched it, and let's just say it left an impact on all of us poor kids. <laughs> Since uh, that first time watching it, uh, I became um, I became interested in comics, and specifically the 1960s uh, underground comics movement, where a lot of these people and animators who made this movie came from and were influenced by uh, a lot of the same people who did heavy metal, which was also a staple of mine when growing up, you know, Zap, Fabulous Fury, Freak Brothers, they were all influenced this film, in my opinion, and have their fingerprints all over it. Um, That being said, this movie is a psychedelic trip. And as we've stated before, that there's not so much a storyline as more of a vibe to this film. And one of the things I like about it is it's definitely still got that very strong 1960s down with fascism kind of feel to it with none of this nonsense today where just like well you know the nazis let's hear what they have to say it's like no nazis are bad guys you use whatever means necessary and uh, avatar's little reveal at the end where he like actually pulls out a luger and shoots 
uh, black wolf right in the chest. That is just the icing on the cake for me. It's like, yeah, at some point you might even have to use the uh, machinations of who you're trying to fight to get them. What it costs you in the long run, well, it's uh, difficult to say. But overall, the rotoscoping and the looping of various animations in this movie even the first time i saw it it kind of bugged me um it's disjointed it's hard to watch but you know you have a few drinks or whatever and this movie is just a trip you go on it is definitely guilty of cinemania in the fact that it does feel a bit like an acid flashback but you know not necessarily a bad one it's worth your time if you can face the cinemania so guilty all right um <clears throat> andy wow wow this film i really came into this wanting to love this film I love stories about the distant future. I love prog rock soundtracks. I love crazy psychedelic art. And yet, watching this film, I did feel like it became something of a chore. It kept getting bogged down under the weight of what it was trying to do and failing to do the necessary heavy lifting to actually get it across. Uh, too many times there are moments where you can see that there's a point they're trying to make, but they can't even find the point. They're just groping around helplessly. And I can't help feeling that this is a case of an animator trying to achieve more than they have the resources to really do. So much of it falls flat just because they didn't take the time to re-edit and rewrite and maybe spend a little more animation, or they didn't have the money to do that. But then, having said that, shouldn't a man's reach always exceed his grasp? Shouldn't we always bite off just a little more than we can chew? Shouldn't we always strive for just that little bit more than we can ever hope to achieve? The answer is no. This film is guilty. It's guilty of not being what it could have been. And what it could have been is something truly special rather than a cinematic oddity that's worth watching but not nearly as important as it thinks that it is. Therefore, I judge it guilty. Uh, well said. Uh, Andre, you, you look uh, eager to say something. <laughs> um, whew, kind of piggybacking off what Andy said, it very much, I guess it went out to get this profound message across of, you know, the, the warning signs of fascism and fascism bad and all of that. Um, but the most that really came across was just like Nazis bad, get them, which isn't bad in of itself, but it's just like the, the, the nuance from the beginning, I guess they were trying to strive for was pretty much entirely lost for look at cool thing. Now look at them beat the fucking living shit out of fascists, which is great. But like, <laughs> you are, fascist. But oh, elf titties. It's just true, <laughs> true. Very much so. This this film really kind of provides a sort of a window into what I would have been doing if I was around at the time. The media I would have been consuming as a edgy teen, early college kind of bit. I don't know. It it was really it was really really interesting. I can see like how there's uh, <laughs> not a lot of difference between then. And now we just have the internet and flash animation and digital paint tools and all of that stuff. And uh, yeah, the, the budget very much went up their noses. Um, but I <laughs> allegedly, feel like that's... Allegedly. Oh, oh, oh allegedly. allegedly. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, was I say that for, for legal reasons. Supposedly, this is what happened. This is alleged. This is not confirmed. Perhaps legendarily, um, even. <laughs> you know, with the mythology surrounding this film, just want to clarify that we're not accusing anybody yeah, of using exactly. illicit substances. This is just, this is the rumor. It is not true. Yeah. Uh, but There's no factual evidence to supporting that statement, just to make it very clear. For some reason, I guess I was expecting it to be more pornographic, but it wasn't. It was just consistently throughout this amalgamation of what the beginnings of adult animation now and uh, they'll, they'll, they'll drop a little little fritz of uh, the beginnings of the furry fandom <laughs> um. <laughs> little fritz of tits for you there <laughs> well, just to um, just to, to kind of throw something out there, because you, um, one of the one of the things you do, if I recall correctly, is you host Dungeons and Dragons sessions yes. for your fans. 
Mm -hmm. um, just to, to give you a little plug there. I think this movie probably had, a, given when it came out, probably had a significant effect on Gary Gygax, who is the author of oh, D&D. Oh, definitely. Um, absolutely. It, one of the D&D uh, spinoff products, Gamma World, probably would not have oh, existed yeah. without this film. If anybody knows about Gamma World, which means yep. Fallout would never have existed because Fallout is basically just a clone of TSR's Gamma World, which was D and D set really? in a far future post nuclear apocalypse setting. Yep, and Traveler. Is that wow, that makes uh, a lot of sense with that Traveler. added context. Like, yeah, yeah, Traveler was more sci-fi. I don't know if I'd That's say Traveler true. per se, but I would say Gamma World most definitely. Most definitely, yeah. you're giving a lot of credit there. <laughs> no, not at all. Have you read the Gamma World source books? Holy shit, man. I mean, like, in terms of the narrative as well, this very much, like, kind of going off of, it's more of a vibe than an actual story. Mm. That's kind of how D&D &D campaigns tend to go. <laughs> yes! You can set up a climax and a, and an inciting incident and blah, 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 all the standard structures of the the hero's journey. But ultimately, you're getting a bunch of fucking idiots rolling dice in a basement. And you're going to have all sorts of fucking fun. And I feel like that's also, at least for me, the appeal of it is that vibe. That sort of half improv, half structured, hey, let's just do some cool shit. Roll some dice to fucking pull a gun out of your shirt that you didn't announce that you had before and plug this guy's ass. Like, <laughs> I think you just described critical role. Not that Oops. we're bashing critical role at all. We love you, Matt oh. Mercer. <laughs> just, just as a side note, the most valued miniature in the Citadel line, the one that is the most collectible that people pay the most money for, is Wizard with a Submachine Gun. Nice. Yep. <laughs> Hell yeah. But yeah, just like the, the nonsensicalness and the fact that they reached so hard but instead went like, you know what? Fuck it. This is a vibe. This is just like a, an anti-fascist vibe. We just don't really like Nazis and they should get shot. Boom. Got them. Anyway, that's that's what I think this film was saying, and that's what I received, and thusly, it has been deemed guilty. Also, 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 um, who's the younger one? The younger guy, Gax? The, I, don't, I don't know. The latest one with the weird company that released that, like, deliberately racist source book? Fuck those guys. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> How about you, Auntie Hope? What is your uh, deliberation and judgment about this film? I was extremely confused through this whole movie. I did not understand what was going on, but there was a definite clear vibe of Nazis are bad, fascists are bad. You know, you can tell who's good and who's bad by who has actual forearms and who has bones instead, right? <laughs> so I'm going to say it's guilty of being very, very unsubtle. It just... It was just so black and white. These guys are bad. These guys are good. There was zero gray in this. So you didn't think that the uh, underlying themes were really reaching out to you in some way for this one? No. <laughs> <laughs> was it when Arthur Dent tried to tell the Vogons what he thought of their poetry? That's how I feel like judging this movie is. <laughs> you know, this this movie did exist during Douglas Adams' lifetime. I wonder what his feelings would have been on this. All, all of these things like Hitchhiker's Guide and Wizards, I mean, this was all part of the same like underground pop culture of the time. Yeah. So it they, the it, there was, yeah, it was a there was a cross pollinization, and this is all the stuff that later on gave us Star Wars and stuff. I mean, you look ah. at Necron ninety nine, you look at Darth Vader. I mean, come on. <laughs> and you, Professor Andrea, scholar of San Francisco, what is your opinion on this film? Based on the female representation in this film, the creators must have been a bunch of virgins in a basement who watch way too much porn. Where to start? Uh, nipples on animated characters, fairy prostitutes, vagina bombing your enemies, sexual poses. Uh, someone asks you to sit for a while and instead she sits on top of him in a sexual pose, uh, not to mention that at the end of the movie, Eleanor gets married to her teacher avatar, who is how many thousands of years older than her, with his comment, let's make it. I would have thought that so many thousands of years in the future, we would have gotten past queasy teacher-student sexual relationships. It isn't 2022 anymore, after all. That's kind of the thing 
the the I mean, I'm not trying to make light of this, but this is apparently actually a serious problem in academia. I can't really speak to it, but I, I know more than a few people who are exploited by their advisors. So, you know, that doesn't mean it make it right. But at the same time, yeah, you'd think that 10 million years in the future that uh, we might have gotten past this. But then again, they did nuke themselves back to the Stone Age. And he does sound like a war detective. So maybe that's where his mindset is. Yeah, it is pretty sweaty, you know, it's it's pretty gross, like like the whole, like like their exploitative relationship being a point of humor. Um, I, I, your point's well taken. I just have to say, since this is a film that launched a thousand scantily clad elven avatars, I must judge it guilty of Cinemania. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Well said. Um, said about a bunch of virgins living in a basement watching entirely too much porn. Um, have you have you seen any other Ralph Bakshi movies? I haven't actually. Well, I, well, I did watch The Hobbit, the animated version, when I was very young. I think The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings were the only ones that weren't uncomfortably sweaty in one way or another. Like. Um, <laughs> Definitely Fritz the Cat, definitely um, Heavy Traffic. Uh, it was an urban adult cartoon set, you know, that was made in the early 70s. Definitely Fire and Ice, which, you know, had basically what looked like penthouse models rotoscoped. Um, <laughs> um, and then you got to remember, this is also the same guy who made Cool World, where... That's the sexy it. version of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yeah, this it was exactly it. It was the guy watching Who Framed Roger Rabbit and being uh, like, you know what would make this movie better? If they actually fucked. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that was the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the same guy, Ralph Bakshi. <laughs> He certainly has a theme to his movies, doesn't he? I, I'm starting to get a sense of it, yes. And you, Profligator Daniel, what is your take on wizards? So, Pontifex, we have a rather unique case in front of us today, I think, personally. We have something which I have never seen before in all my sojourns. And let me tell you, I have sojourned. This, I think is a rare, possibly unique example of bi-quadratic cinemania. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking four levels of cinemania. That's like four inceptions. C cinemania is not squared, it's not cubed, it's to the fourth power. Yes, yes, exactly. Four powers. Not three, sir, three, but four. Allow me to explain. Uh, but... I will explain delicately for the ears of our listeners who may not be so protected from these kinds of binomial diversions. We have a film which at its heart is thematically a warning against cinemania. It is a screed against the dangers of cinemania that could come from exploring too deeply into technology. And how does it demonstrate this in the plot? But you see a device designed to cause cinemania used against the elves, driving them insane. Furthermore, how does it do this? But it projects films from the Nazi era, which themselves are sources of cinemania. Lastly, this film is, of course, a source of cinemania. So that is not one, not two, not three, but four layers of cinemania. Ah, 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 ah. Sorry. So, I mean, I, I don't think we can do anything but judge it as, as guilty. Uh, I don't know if we can actually add to the charges and, and judge it guilty times four. Um, is that a thing we can do if we, check I, the, if we check the rule book? I don't see any reason we couldn't. Okay, well, there you go. I, I put in four votes for guilty. Well, okay, so to be fair, I've taken a piss out of this movie, but that's only because I love it so much. I wouldn't make fun of it if I didn't love it. I wouldn't make fun of it. <clears throat> I have just... For full transparency, I have the Wizards poster, the one with Necron 99 on his blob horse, up on the wall at my office at work, right next to my Buckaroo Banzai poster. Individual images from this film look great. You could take a frame of this movie and blow it up into a poster and be like, yes, that's an amazing prog rock-esque 70s poster. Yeah. But when they're animating from beginning to end and you have to get a narrative out of it and you're watching it as a story, that's where... It's sort of the narrative is just 
mean, piece yeah. by piece and it doesn't connect it. It's the so vibe is great. The yeah, visuals well, are great. The... And we can we can shit all over the animation, you know. But at the same point, like, dude, Andy, you and I know animation is hard. Like, we have this animated thing that we've been doing, and it's very time consuming. So, like, you know, even with all this stuff sped up using Adobe After Effects and and Photoshop and all, and the whole process being you know mechanized and and done you know by computer, it's still very labor intensive. So, you know, the fact that these, you know, but at this, like, you have an independent animation studio that is funded by 20th Century Fox, but they don't have the kind of resources that Disney had. And they're doing stuff that, but yeah, I mean, like, there's a lot of No one has ever had the resources Disney yeah, has. But, yeah, to be I fair, mean, they, Disney's uh, they whole have, point. They've got limited resources. So Bakshi thinks, I know, I'm going to animate an apocalyptic battle between globe spanning armies taking place a million years in the future. Maybe set your sights a little bit lower towards yeah. something that you could achieve a bit better, Bakshi. Yeah, fair yeah. point. I mean, like up to that point, the only thing you could see that looked remotely like a mass battle in animation was maybe the night on Bald Mountain scene at the end of Fantasia. That's the only thing I can think of that might have had that same sort of look. And but, I mean, doing what with what they had, I mean, they made some really iconic things like like you were talking about the. The, on the poster, Necron 99 sitting on the blob horse. I mean, people have that tattooed on them. And I mean, yeah, that, that whole imagery was, stuck, was yeah. and that image was sort of taken by uh, Frank Fazetta from his like death dealer. Yeah. Um, that was definitely a callback uh, to things. Frank Fazetta. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a lot. Now, um, there's a lot like you're saying, a lot of cross pollinization there. So, now, here's what you have to consider. Later on, after this, Bakshi went on to do the Lord of the Rings animated film, and he Bakshi. used a lot of the same kind of techniques, but they were more refined, and it, effectively, the stuff he began here came to fruition a lot more with his Lord of the Rings. Now, how do we feel? Was it was it worth him going in this direction? Or is, this a, is this something that could have been the future of animation if it kept going and kept refining it? Well, I think it reached its uh, mm. it reached its its pinnacle with Fire and Ice uh, in the mm. early '80s. And, that and, was badass. That yeah. was a great movie. So, like, say say what you want. Like, you know, I, I I think it he he did a thing that not a lot of people had done. I think that's up to the viewer, honestly. I, I'm going I'm going but to say I'm bringing... going to say this as rotoscoping and what he was doing. That's the precursor to motion capture. And what we what they're doing now, I mean, without all this rotoscoping animation, would we have like the motion capture ideas that led to Andy Serkis's career? <laughs> well, rotoscoping, he didn't pioneer rotoscoping, though. He, the, that was That's not what thing. he says. Well, I don't know if he actually said that, but going like, but but Disney actually did a bunch of rotoscoping, mm -hmm. like in a lot of their their, you know, like go, going back into the, what, the 40s or I think was it Snow White? One of, anyway, yeah, a number of the right. Disney features used rotoscoping in much the same way that Ralph actually did. So, I mean, it's definitely safe to call him a pioneer of sorts because he was trying adult animation and animation techniques that were interesting and new. So, a, a pioneer of a kind, somebody has to be the first to stick their head above the parapet and try yeah. something new, even if they stumble at first. So, I think it's safe to call him a pioneer, a crazy drugged up horny horny pioneer <laughs> <laughs> well uh, i hey. mean yeah okay so speaking of horny yes wizards does have some problematic bits and but i mean really point me to any movie produced in the 70s that doesn't um and you know like yeah we've harshed on boomers a lot uh, for allowing their kids to consume media filled with um, what figurative buried razors um mm, kids they, these are the same guys who feared actual buried razors in our halloween candy but you know go figure Anyway, um, I think I remember hospitals offering to X-ray your candy for free <laughs> just to check for razors. Hey, kids, let us you know there's nothing candy. better. We, you know, we can't offer health care, but we can we can X-ray your candy. Uh, well, we have I mean, gone way off on a tangent. Yeah, here. well, but there's, something, there's something to that though. There's something to that that the that the to the boomer idea that whatever kids don't understand will just bounce off their brains, and. If it, they did understand it, then that was a red flag, you know. And, and as a case in point, my dad recorded my four-year-old self reading an explicit letter to his buddy, the underground comics artist S. Clay Wilson. Speaking of Zap Comics, he had me read a letter he had written to to Wilson into a cassette tape that he then sent to Wilson as a gag. And I don't remember anything about it. I clearly recall that even then I didn't understand anything in it other than some of these are naughty words that I usually get in trouble for repeating. 
But um, anyway, that's an aside. But yeah, I can confirm that, yeah, I, like you, Zach, I watched Wizards probably a little early at age 10. And most of the adult stuff went way over my head, though mm -hmm. I can admit that to my 10-year-old brain, Eleanor was interesting to me in a way that I couldn't <laughs> quite define in much the same way that Jessica Rabbit was also interesting to my 10-year-old brain. Um, no, I can also say I didn't notice Tower Phallus until I watched it again for this conflict. I was like, man, that is a dick. <laughs> that is a fucking dick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, I did not see that. And I've seen this movie, I don't know, uh, I, at least 10 times. Um, but the thing is, uh, 10 year old me still got the key takeaways, which were, as we have said, one, fascism is always bad, no matter whether it's a now, 80 years ago, 10 million years in the future, it's bad. Don't do a fascism. Two, fascism resurges periodically, and it has to be fought back down whenever it does, or really bad shit happens. And you know, three, that's actually very interesting that even back then he called it, you know, yeah, fascism and Hitler and all that shit will rear its head again. Well, Doesn't it was matter. rearing its head in the 70s, you know, as that's there was true. A, like the anytime the economy economy turns bad and people start suffering, then folks want to do a fascism. That's you know, fascism cannot exist without a certain level of background suffering. And then this uh, uh, this would have been around the age of Watergate, wouldn't it? When yeah, this was the mid uh, when so filmmakers have learned do not trust the government. It turns out they're yeah. actually bad guys sometimes. Yeah, so nineteen. Massive... I think the worst thing that came out of Watergate was calling every scandal something gate. So, that's the worst thing. I uh -huh. that's the thing it. that's worse. I mean, maybe the most pervasive. Well, the, maybe the not thing, the worst, the most pervasive. But yeah, this this they started production on this film in 1975. The Vietnam War had ended in a defeat for the United States because we never should have been there in the first fucking place. But oh well. Um, but yeah, all the nasty, horrible shit with Kissinger, and then all of the people who got up in arms at the end of that. Anyway, but like, but the number three point that I took away from this it was people are complicated, and someone doesn't have to be perfect to be a good guy. The broad strokes are there. If they're against fascism, this is somebody you want on your side. Pro people are problematic. People are complicated. And you don't have to be perfect to be a good guy in that sense, at least. Of, you know, of, of like, you recognize fascism is bad, stop. Uh, okay. In the words of Douglas Adams, to summarize the summary, people yeah. are the problem. Yeah. This film has more of a vibe than an actual plot, and that's okay. Not every piece of visual art is done in photorealistic detail either. Like, cubism. You get the essence of a subject. Look at Marcel Duchamp's Nude Descending a Staircase. Bakshi, yeah, you know, we've given him a lot of criticism. He's taken a lot of criticism over the years for this film being, you know, a copy of underground comics and heavy metal and being derivative. But fucking find me a piece of art that isn't. <laughs> like, these days we get excited about references to our favorite pieces of media built into other media. You drop a Blues Brothers reference or a Star Wars reference into some completely unrelated TV series or movie and the audience shits its collective pants with joy. It's yeah, like, it's not like we do any of that on this podcast, though. Never, We're above no. that. No. It's like, it's nachos. It's food you eat with other food. Kevin Smith and <laughs> Quentin Tarantino both built careers on cinematic nachos. There's an artsy term for it, postmodern pastiche. Uh, uh, say uh, what you like about this film. Once you've seen it, you're not going to forget about it. No, <laughs> that's no, true. No, it sticks in and your that, head. That's why it stays in the zeitgeist. Yes. So, uh, actually, as a side note, when you mentioned about uh, uh, 20th Century Fox, uh, Star Wars... And wizards are kind of like the brothers in this, right? Star Wars is, wizards is like the black wolf to Star Wars' avatar. They were both <laughs> in production at 20th Century Fox at the same time. Both came out the same summer. And George Lucas hasn't taken anything like the kind of flack that Bakshi has taken over the years, despite Star Wars itself being a pastiche of Flash Gordon, Dune, and the Seven Samurai. And, you know, yes, he's taken yeah, some but criticism, to... but Bakshi gets shit on and Lucas doesn't. And, oh, and, Lucas, oh, gets Lucas shit gets on shit on. He gets plenty. shit on, but what I mean is that, like, like to the. To but look, Lucas actually made somewhat of a narrative that made some small bit of sense. Are you kidding me? Watch the first Star Wars. It's an absolute <laughs> hash. I mean, we all love it, but the point, my, my point is that yes, he's taken shit, but Bakshi has taken a whole lot more shit. And and as yeah. uh, also, Wizards was never supposed to, was supposed to have been called War Wizards until Uncle George politely asked Ralph to alter the title so it wouldn't compete with Star Wars. And much like Star Wars, Wizards also had a major influence on media franchises that followed. Though you know maybe not quite as monolithically as Star Wars had. Heavy Metal as a movie probably wouldn't have existed if it hadn't been for Wizards. Um, we mentioned that both the fantasy and sci-fi sides of Warhammer prob uh, probably wouldn't exist without Wizards. Gamma World, Fallout, all of that. 
And it, all of that draws heavily on wizards as sort of the source material. And as we also mentioned, Ian Miller produced art for both wizards and Warhammer. So anyway, as this film has contributed to Cinemania and the general media landscape, as well as on all the charges listed previously, I find this film guilty. And kids, if you're thinking of shitting on this film, maybe take it back, she. Uh, I see what you did there. I still don't get it. But look, it's a simple story. Boy meets girl meets world. World explodes, mutants rule the irradiated wasteland of what remains from the before times. Insane rules of quasi-monarchical succession process make girl hereditary she-president, queen of the rad wastes. Robot shoots blob horse, elf stabs robot, girl complains, boy rebuilds robot with lobotomy, and everyone sets off to inevitable confrontation over the future of what the world once was. Elves attack everyone. Girl uses crotch lasers to attack elves. Boy does nothing about it, while other boy uses magical Hitler YouTube to radicalize morons. Everyone gets lost in the snow when tanks appear and important plot events are referenced but never seen. Boy loses his mind, girl loses her mind, robot has no mind, and elf is an idiot. Everyone meets up in rotoscope war zone hell, armored knights attack, machine guns, inevitable long-winded battle scene, boy meets boy, and after a violent gun battle declares that pacifism is great and everything will be fine now. Retires to shag girl, Hitler is dead again, everyone had a lovely day. It's all the same thing we've heard a million times before. If there aren't any further judgments to render, I declare this conclave adjourned. Where's my gavel? You, uh, left it back in the restricted room. God damn it. Fine. Conclave adjourned. Now that we're adjourned, I'm afraid I have more bad news. Oh, yeah, no that's bad a big news. Of course. Uh, of course you do. Uh, I have this telegram, you see. How do you even have a smartphone, let alone a Telegram account? Smartphone? What confounded newfanglery are you talking about? Never mind, give it here. Christ, who even uses Telegrams anymore? Oh. Oh, that's who. Dear God. Give it here. <clears throat> Notice from the Central Committee, Geneva. Stop. Chapter Charter revoked. Stop. Disband immediately or face consequences. Stop. Message ends. Stop. Consequences? What consequences could a bunch of movie nerds in Switzerland possibly inflict? The dreaded Cinemania kill team. You mean the dreaded Cinema Assassins? Ethan, you never told me about the kill team when you invited me to join. Well, yeah. Look, it's not that big a deal. We're just talking about a cadre of steely-eyed assassins conditioned by watching nothing but John Wick movies on constant repeat. I'm an academic. I'm only trained to defend my dissertations. Here, you can have my fez back. Sorry, we glued it to your head. Kill team? Seriously? Oh, what did I get myself into? How do I leave? You You don't. don't. Once you're in, you're in for life. Ride or die. Didn't didn't they just throw us out or something? Isn't that what revoked charter means? Oh, yes, but... Then, then how can we be in for life if we just got thrown out? We just can't watch movies or hold meetings or judge anything. Can't hold meetings? About movies or does teaching classes count? They were surprisingly unclear on that point. How will I make a living? Ugh, way to screw up my life forever. What? No. Fuck them. They don't get to tell me when I can't watch movies with my friends. Yeah, you tell yeah. them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's right. No. Yeah. yeah. If you would call what we do watching movies with friends. But what about the kill team? Uh, the kill team's always just been a rumor anyway. Are we talking about a rumor in the heart? And if they're not a rumor, based on everything else I've seen about this organization, I'm not at all worried about their competence. Who's for going rogue? Aye! Aye. So cute. The season one finale of the Cinemania Society was written, produced, and performed by Andrea Palladino, Andre Luke Martinez, Andy Slack, Zachariah Burks, Hope Bravo, Daniel Scribner, and Ethan Ireland. Featuring the voice talents of Georgia McKenzie and Chris Laird. Produced, mixed, and mastered by Ethan Ireland and Andy Slack. Graphic design by Andy Slack. Music by Carl Casey at White Bad Audio. Visit our website at thecinemaniasociety.podbean.com. 
We'd like to hear what our listeners think. So if you have feedback about our show, suggestions for movies you'd like us to review in season two, just want to say hi or leave snarky comments, you can check out our social media feeds. We have a Facebook group. We're on Twitter at TCS underscore Cinemania. And you can join our subreddit at r slash the Cinemania Society. If you really like what you heard, you can visit us on Ko-Fi to throw us a few bones. We love to make fun stuff for folks, but maintaining a podcast sure isn't free. Anything and everything helps. Also, for our long-term listeners, we're sorry to have disappointed those who are holding out all year for some video content from us. We're getting there. Sooner or later, we'll get something visual out for you. We've put out a show for you every week for the past year, and now we're going to take a well-earned break. We have a live show coming up, and then the Society will return for Season 2 sometime in 2023. The Cinemania Society is a production of the Cinemania Society, LLC.